Hello. We're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, CDC Evaluation of a Two-Tier Lyme Disease EIA Testing Method and Potential Diagnostic Significance. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by BU Marriott a world leader in the field of in vitro diagnostics for more than 50 years, BU Maria is present in more than 150 countries through 42 subsidiaries and a large network of distributors. BU Maria provides the diagnostic solutions, reagents, instruments, and software which determine the source of disease and contamination to improve patient health and ensure consumer safety. Its products are mainly used for diagnosing infectious diseases. To learn more, visit www.dumaria-usa.com. Let's get started. You can pose questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the Q&A box, which will open when you click the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at lower left. I now present today's speaker, Lena Prisco, PhD. Dr. Ursula Lena Prisco has a PhD in pharmacology. As a laboratory and clinical researcher and as a former laboratory director at Martha's Vineyard Hospital, Dr. Prisco serves as a clinical researcher and consultant for many health-related and laboratory organizations, including BU Maria Incorporated, Quidel, and Medscape. Dr. Prisco will now begin her presentation. Good afternoon, good morning, and thank you for joining me. Uh, I'd like to spend today talking to you about uh, two-tier Lyme testing and incorporating uh, the current uh, CDC uh, manuscript that was written recently regarding this test. As Judy said, um, the second slide um, actually uh, shows a little bit more about me. Um, I was an early adopter of this Vitus Lyme 2 dissociated assay, and I have run thousands of specimens using the assay. Um, I will show you uh, data that I presented in 2015 uh, using this assay in a validation uh, protocol, and I am currently on the Dukes County Health Commission. So if you'll forgive me, for those of you who are familiar, uh, more familiar than others with Lyme disease, I thought I'd ground us for a few slides in uh, Lyme and uh, ticks in particular. So if you look here on the left of your screen, that is the black-footed tick, uh, Ixodes scapularis. Um, at the bottom in the uh, middle is a tick that is engorged and unengorged. Uh, and you'll notice the dramatic size of when a tick has been feeding. This particular uh, tick, uh, for those of you who are wondering, uh, was engorged and was feeding for, uh, we uh, estimated when we took the picture, about 36 hours. Uh, up in the right-hand corner is a uh, hematoxylin stain of a spirochete taken from the spinal fluid of an infected patient. So one of the things that uh, actually makes this uh, disease uh, transmission uh, difficult is that the uh, size actually matters. Now, there are lots of different ticks, and you'll notice on the left, you'll see uh, the size differential between an adult uh, male, female, a nymph, and a larva. And then there's the lone star tick, uh, and at the bottom, the dog tick. So most of us are familiar with the larger dog tick, and those of us who have dogs, cats, et cetera, we routinely pull these off our animals. However, uh, in the case of Lyme, size really does matter. If you look at the picture on the right, you'll see how small that nymph stage really is of this tick. And this uh, nymph stage is the most infected uh, form of uh the transmission of the disease. Uh, and because of its small size, it's not always easily detected, uh, even, uh, you know, unclear, visible, unclear skin. Uh, 
um, and it likes to uh, congregate in certain areas where you may not detect it at all, and that is in uh, hairlines, uh, in socks, legs, pants, uh, etc. So it makes it particularly difficult uh, to know that it's there. So one of the other things that's important is to realize that the life cycle is a two-year life cycle for these ticks. So it actually begins, if you start on the left in the spring, the larva, the female tick, drops off its deer host and lays the eggs on the ground, and the larva begins to develop. Uh, most of the transmission actually um, starts through the white-footed mouse. The larva feeds on small animals where it's picked up, uh, and the mouse uh, then transmits it through the brush, et cetera. Uh, we end up in the fall and winter where the larva becomes dormant. In the following spring, the larva molts and then becomes into, uh, turns into the nymph, which is the most aggressive stage. Uh, the nymph then uh, is usually, along with the mouse and feeding on the deer, uh, tr is transferred to another host. And that host uh, often, for people who are walking in the woods, et cetera, brushing up against leaves, um, in their yards, et cetera, it becomes a host, uh, and that's when they become infected. Uh, the nymph then grows to adult, and we start all over again. Um, it's interesting to know in years where the winters are mild, and particularly here where I'm located on Martha's Vineyard, uh, adult ticks are not uh, killed, so there's a greater uh, production of food for both the mouse and the deer, and then all that also produces a consequent rise in the uh, tick population, because ticks are not killed off as well. So I put this in here because I wanted to show a progression of our ability and our knowledge of uh, detecting this disease. So if you look at the color, I want you to focus on the, um, the darker colors, where those are the areas of, are of high risk. And this was uh, from the National Lime Bank uh, predicted uh, database in the year 2000. So we're talking, you know, 17 years ago, where you can see in those dark areas where that really was the areas that we, you know, considered to be high risk areas. But I want you to look at the pink area as well, as, uh, as well. And notice that in the southeast and the west and the uh, upper uh, west, uh, and even in portions of the Midwest, there was considered to be a very low risk of disease in uh, 2000. If we then look at CDC reported cases in 2001, you start to see these dots where there begins to be a bit of a spread, where not only do we see the same dark areas in those same areas that we were aware of, but now we're starting to see cases in Florida, Texas, a higher concentration in Ohio, Minnesota, California, uh, and up in Washington State. From there, we move to 2015, and now you can see the dramatic uh, difference where there is a much higher concentration in the Northeast. It appears to be spreading south. The concentration in the uh, Midwest uh, is much heavier, and there is now more and more uh, incident reports in uh, Florida, California, and in the Northwest. So here um, shows a graph. Uh, from the CDC Lyme database as of 2015 and what they call confirmed versus uh, probable cases. Now, probable cases um, are those that, um, based on serologic testing, uh, were equivocal. So if we looked at uh, confirmed cases only, those are the darker bars, and that uh, really is based on uh, serology. Um, it's also important uh, to note uh, that these uh, numbers do not include patients who present with symptoms uh, and may uh, be treated uh, without serologic testing. So these are only patients who, re who reported positive by serologic testing. Now, um, there's been a lot of talk about why there's a difference between reported and actual cases and why the discrepancy. And recently, 
Um, I'm sure you've all heard that there are uh, reports now that the CDC does actually estimate that the actual cases may be in the range from the mid 200,000s to close to uh, 460,000 and more uh, cases. And there are several reasons for that. Um, the actual confirmed patients uh, must have a bullseye rash. Now, for some areas, not everyone gets a bullseye. So we're talking about, you know, at the most, a reported 70% of patients uh, with a rash. I can say here uh, on the island where we have a pr very high incidence of uh, Lyme disease, there's probably only about 35% of the patients that we actually see uh, in any given summer who come in uh, with a rash. So it's either they're coming in before the rash develops or they never develop one. Um, the other issue is to be positive, you have to be positive in serology tests. Uh, and many uh, cases are diagnosed as having Lyme disease uh, based on symptomology alone and a lot of clinicians uh, will not then test. They just diagnose the patient based on symptoms uh, with or without the presence of a rash and treat them. Uh, the third issue is positive results are reported to public health offices where the patient's primary residence is located. So if you look to the right, some of these case numbers may be slightly off. Um, as, for example, here uh, on Martha's Vineyard, we have many people who come here to visit who were probably bitten here uh, by a tick, become infected with Lyme, but actually go home uh, somewhere else where they're diagnosed. So our actual incidence and prevalence numbers uh, may be uh, incorrect. So I can imagine that you know, may happen in other places uh, throughout uh, the world as well. And finally, uh, most health agents, uh, agencies re, uh, send paperwork to physicians uh, to uh, fill out this report on uh, Lyme disease. And I know uh, for us, one of the uh, cases, and now that we have electronic medical records, et cetera, physicians are inundated with uh, all kinds of administrative tasks that they have to do. And, uh, the paperwork isn't often filled out, uh, mainly because uh, they also, in the physicians I have spoken to, feel that it's not a communicable disease, so they're less apt to fill out that paperwork. So when we talk about the tick, tick life cycle, we also then can then map that back to a distribution of infection on months and months, and that varies. So. Obviously, you see a very low infection rate when it's cold and there may be snow on the ground, et cetera, and that starts to peak uh, when we are outside, and that's May, June, July, August, uh, September, uh, usually for most areas. Now, uh, on the island, we also see another bump uh, in October, November, and even sometimes up into the first couple weeks of December because we have a lot of hunters. Uh, hunters sit in tree stands and they walk through the woods, et cetera, and at that point they become less aware uh, that the ticks are uh, still active, et cetera. So we do get quite a few uh, infections and another bump that will actually equal the levels we see in uh, either May or August at certain times of the year uh, later in the year. So um, for those of you who are not as familiar with the actual symptoms, um, I want to uh, focus on the left side of this slide. Uh, we're, you know, looking at um, here's a number of cases, about two, a little over 200,000 cases, and you can see that, you know, 71% of the cases um, have the uh, characteristic rash. 30% uh, uh, sh uh, are showing arthritis and then Bell's palsy at nine at the mo next most frequent uh, symptom. And then you'll see cardiac, meningitis, and radicular neuropathy uh, following along. Um, as I mentioned, here uh, on the uh, island, we see less cases with uh, the rash um, and quite a few cases of what we would call Lyme arthritis. 
Now, if you look at the right side of the screen, um, the general thought is, is there are three stages to this disease, and they happen in days and weeks to months uh, to years. Uh, stage one being the uh, rash happening in days to weeks, uh, chills, fever, um, what we call here the summer flu, uh, which really doesn't uh, exist. It's most likely some tick-borne disease with the highest probability being uh, Lyme disease. Uh, moving to stage two, which is weeks to months, where people will report facial muscle and other muscle weakness, muscle aches, uh, joint aches, uh, cardiac abnormalities, and sometimes palpitations. And then stage three, where you really get into that chronic uh, area where chronic sy symptoms persist of muscle weakness, uh, parenthesias, uh, difficulty with speech, uh, irregular muscle movements, and some neurologic symptoms. So let's take a look at what this rash actually uh, can look like. So most people, it's been called the bull's eye, um, and that's uh, true, and that's the one that you would see at the bottom in this uh, representation. Um, however, I have seen patients with one bite and rashes over their entire body. I have seen patients with very pinpoint rashes and uh, that are of a small centimeter in size, depending on, you know, where they were bitten, et cetera. Uh, some of them are uniform. Some of them blister. Some of them have bruising patterns. Um, some of them are just spread uh, and spread. They are not round uh, at all. Um, so there can be a variety of presentations. So um, to actually uh, think that they, they're quite heterogeneous, um, and there can be numerous or uh, single uh, EMs. So when we're testing for Lyme disease, what are we trying to detect? Uh, those of us who do this uh, for a living um, uh, know that we're, you know, looking at antibodies. And these antibody production in Lyme disease uh, takes on two stages. You have your first stage in the early stage where they are the much larger uh, antibodies, the IgM Lyme antibodies, and then uh, later on, uh, IgG antibodies form. Um, it's thought that seroconversion from IgM to IgG antibodies begins after about, you know, nine to ten weeks. You start to see, uh, or months, the, that seroconversion take place. But I would caution to say that it doesn't always happen. Um, I have seen uh, patients here that have had persistent IgM uh, antibodies uh, up to, you know, at least two or three years after infection. So I, I wouldn't really use this as a rule of thumb. Um, however, that is not, you know, the way we think of it. We think of seroconversion. And our current interpretation of uh, Western blots, which I'll get to in a minute, um, actually uses that concept of seroconversion uh, to uh, interpret uh, positive or negativity. Uh, but one of the things I'd like to uh, also emphasize is that from patient to patient, obviously because we're talking about an immune response, there is a variability of antibody production. So that inherently also affects our ability to detect these antibodies and their presence from patient to patient. So I think we need to keep that in mind. These, you know, none of this is, you know, written in, in gold standard. Uh, we know that these antibodies exist, but uh, as in uh, many uh, immune uh, diseases, you have antibody production that can uh, vary from patient to patient in terms of time and amount. So this is the standard uh, algorithm that is used, and in the uh, CDC paper that we will be discussing, this is what they call the STTT, or the standard algorithm. Um, patients are screened for at first presentation with the ELISA, the EIA. Um, if it is positive or equivocal, they move to the Western blot, uh, both an IgM and an IgG. If it is negative, you report it as negative, and there's no further testing required with this particular specimen. Um, there is a note that if the disease duration is uh, short, 
um, you can then do it again after 14 to 21 days if clinical per uh, symptoms persist or if it's indicated at all clinically. If you look to the left side, positive or equivocal, as I said, IgM and IgG Western blot, um, if the blot is inter interpreted as positive, you report it as positive. Now, positive in this case is at least five or more bands present for IgG and two or more bands for IgM. If it is interpreted as negative, you report it as negative, and again, if the disease duration is short, you would redo it after you do another screen. So the Western blot in and of itself is not done in isolation. It is confirmatory testing of what you find in the EIA. Um, for those of you who have never seen one, and again, I apologize for those of you who have, this is a representative uh, snapshot uh, of a IgG uh, Lyme Western blot. And if you look to the far uh, right of your screen, that is the positive control. On the far left is the negative control. And lanes two through seven are patients. And here's where you can see the variability in response. Uh, lane two and three would be considered uh, positive, four, five, six, and seven, uh, because they have less than five bands would be interpreted as negative for an IgG uh, Western blot. So this is actually taken from uh, the Mayo Clinic uh, and how they uh, actually interpret and send out in terms of their uh, interpretation guidance that is sent out on all their uh, Lyme Western blots reports. Um, and what I want to emphasize here is that there are often times you can have the presence of Lyme antibodies uh, and still be interpreted as uh, having not having the disease. Um, and it actually happens quite a bit. So if you look at in the first uh, boxes at the top, uh, you have an IgM blot that's positive, you have more than two bands, but your IgG plot is, is negative. Um, the laboratory interpretation of this is a couple of things. It could be either early disease, it's less than four weeks, so in other words, they are positive for IgM, they have not seroconverted yet, or it could be a past treated infection. So in other words, they've been treated in the past based on an IgM response, so they never seroconverted. However, in a lot of clinicians' eyes, this would be negative, and I'll get to that in a minute. In the second line, you see an IgM blot that is negative, less than two bands. You see an IgG blot that is positive. Um, this is considered to be a past-treated infection or the person has seroconverted. And again, clinically, this would also often be considered negative by many cl clinicians. And I'll ex again, I'll explain in a minute. And then we have the standard of uh, what is in the CDC algorithm, two positive IgM bands, at least five positive IgG bands, and that is considered clinically positive with, with some seroconversion taking place. And the last case is less than two bands in IgM, less than five bands in IgG, uh, if there are no bands that are negative, and if there are just a few bands, it's considered they may have had some exposure or, past or it be a past-treated infection, and that is co considered clinically negative. Now, let me just make mention a little bit about these, the, the clinical interpretation. What often happens with most clinicians is they look at the blots as a total report. They are not looking at the results of the IgM blot, and they don't look at the IgG blot as separate results. So therefore, unless they see a positive positive in both areas of that uh, IgG blot uh, response, um, many clinicians who are not familiar with the disease will then say that um, that person is not infected with Lyme. So I want to just bring your attention a little bit to, uh, as I mentioned, the validation study that I was involved with in uh, 2014 and into 2015. 
What we did here was we looked at our banked uh, clinical samples and, and ran an analysis of um, these samples in the uh, total uh, Vitus Lyme assay versus the dissociated assay, looking at uh, correlations and uh, the difference between the number of Western blots that would be required. And what we found uh, was interesting. So if we ran the uh, light total, in other words, uh, the non-dissociated assay, anything that was positive, you had to run through uh, a Western blot. In other words, a Western blot was required. Um, of those, 76 of them actually ended up being Western blot uh, required and positive. So you had a percent uh, results that were confirmed by Western blot of about 42 percent. When you ran, when we ran the dissociated assay and only ran those specimens in each blot based on their positivity or negativity in each of the assays. In other words, if if the Lyme M was positive, we ran the Lyme M Western blot. If the IgG portion was negative, we did not run the IgG. And the same for the IgG dissociated assay. So if the IgG was, a, was positive, we ran it in the Western blot for IgG and not IgM. I should also note that all equivocals were considered positive, so those were run on the IgM side as well. Um, and, despite, and using that paradigm, you can see that um, there was a significant difference in the amount of Western blots that were uh, needed to be run and that the percent of results that were confirmed by Western blot was significantly different. So what we actually showed in this uh, assay was that we saw about a 23% reduction in the number of uh, Western blots that were needed to definitively determine the Lyme diagnosis when you looked at the two different uh, assays as, as opposed to being a total versus the dissociated assay. So let's uh, now move to this current uh, CDC assay. Um, and what uh, was done here um, was actually you know, excellent work, and I'd like to give uh, anyone who's on the phone that may be from the CDC a uh, shout out. Um, it was uh, very, very uh, thorough and very excellent work. Um, and briefly, let me just describe what they did. So uh, BioMirio recently launched its dissociated first-year uh, test, and that was available to everyone, um, I believe, as of January this year. Um, the dissociated Vitus uh, assay uh, uses a purified recombinant test antigen. But what's important here is the IgG part of the assay also includes the variant region, invariant region of, the C, of IR6, which we would commonly call the C6. Uh, by testing the IgM and the IgG antibodies separately as a first tier, it provides an opportunity for those of us who use the assay uh, for a different uh, diagnostic testing algorithm than what you see with the standard testing. And I'll go through some of that uh, in a minute and tell you why. So the rationale and how, what they did uh, for methods was they used uh, 471 uh, bank serum samples that they had from Lyme patients. They uh, used previously collected and published data on study samples uh, from a variety of sources including uh, for the Western blots, for immunetics, um, in terms of IgG and IgM Western blotting, and they used the uh, C6 uh, assay also from uh, Veristripe. So the two-tiered test interpretation was performed according to rec recommended CDC guidelines, uh, and as previously reported for all samples. So that means that in order to be called uh, positive on the Western blot, you had to be, meet both levels of that criteria. Uh, 
IgM and IgG. And I apologize, this is a little blurry. This is uh, actually taken directly and dropped in from the paper. But the upshot is, is that there was uh, a great correlation between the total assay and the dissociated assay. So um, the sensitivities and specificities were both very uh, similar. Um, one of the things that they did look at that clinically we don't always pay attention to, but in research uh, we often do, is other potential comorbidities and confounding factors when we're testing for Lyme disease. And you'll see uh, some of those uh, cases here where they looked at specimens with other diseases, et cetera, that are sometimes known to cross-react uh, in these assays. Um, and you should uh, note that the total assay had a higher uh, cross-reactivity with other diseases than the dissociated assay. But as I mentioned, um, you can also, um, you know, leave that up to most clinicians um, may screen for these at the same time. Uh, but since the sensitivity was uh, and specificity was so high, um, most uh, clinicians are, are fine uh, with not also testing for these unless they get back a Lyme negative result. So here uh, in this particular uh, table, you can see the results that they got uh, with uh, a variety uh, of two-tiered testing. So what they did here was what they call standard testing, where you see uh, the total assay to the far left, the dissociated assay, the next column, and then the C6 assay as the confirmatory test in the third column, the fourth column, is uh, the C6 assay in the modified testing following the dissociated assay in the last column on the right. And what this shows you is that the sensitivities and specificities uh, when the two different strategies were followed um, were actually uh, pretty similar. There was a 76% sensitivity for the C6 out, what we'll call the modified C6 algorithm with the total Lyme assay and a 77% sensitivity with the dissociated assay using the C6 as the follow-up uh, assay. Um, however, there were significantly higher sensitivities obtained when um, immunoblots were used as the second-tier test. So the modified algorithm approach in this case uh, resulted in significant in higher sensitivities compared to the standard testing algorithm. So what this is really saying is, is that, you know, Western blot, although this is what we routinely use, uh, may lack some uh, sensitivity um, in terms of our follow-up testing. And um, that's probably best uh, shown by this. It's a little uh, more, uh, less complicated than what you just saw. So if you look in total across the study, what the upshot is, is it reduced the number of Western blots required. So if on the right you look at the total assay, for all of those 471 that were EIAs that were initially performed, 159 of them were positive or equivocal. And in that assay, you don't know if that's IgM-specific or IgG-specific. You just know that you have a positive assay. That required 159 IgM immunoblots and 159 IgG immunoblots. Now, these numbers in parentheses re refer to the numbers of immunoblots that were required if you used a 30-day duration of disease cutoff. CDC guidance recommends that anyone who is thought to be infected longer than 30 days, that you not run an IgM immunoblot, as those results are suspect. However, clinically, I think we can all agree that that rarely happens. You get a positive on that uh, Lyme screen, the, the ELISA, you run both immunoblots. Um, you really uh, don't uh, pay much attention to the duration of disease. You run them both. Nonetheless, 
Out of the original 471 at the bottom, you could see you had to run a total of 318 uh, Western blots. In the middle, there were 942 uh, EIAs performed. Now remember, that's 471 IgM ELISAs and 471 IgG EIAs. So initially, you're running double what you would normally run because you're running them both separately. When you get the results from those, from there, there were 131 Lyme EIAs that were positive or equivocal and 101 Lyme IgG EIAs that were positive. Break it down further, when that was run as a confirmatory test for immunoblots, 131 of them were positive on IgM and 101 were positive on IgG, so 232 of those immunoblots were positive, which is less than what we saw in the first assay protocol. If you follow up the modified testing protocol and use the C6 as your testing, you'll see 471 C6 EIAs were performed, that asterisk I wanted to call your attention to is that this would exclude IgM testing because as if you remember, I said the invariant region of the IR6 portion on the antibody is C6 and it is on IgG. It is not on IgM. So therefore, you're really only looking at IgG responses here. From the original 471, 112 of the C6 EIAs were positive or equivocal. Of those, 112 IgM immunoblots were run, 112 IgG immunoblots were run, and you came up with 224 total immunoblots. Now, one of the things that's interesting, no matter which protocol you went through, whether it was the dissociated ice, uh, assay or the C6 assay, you still ended up with fewer immunoblots than you do if you ran the total assay. So the overall findings that confirm that there is a reduction of at least 23% in the number of immunoblots needed when you run the dissociated assay as the first tier uh, EIA. And that's pretty much very close and almost exactly the same number of reduction that we saw in the uh, 147 that we ran. Uh, the number of false positives using the uh, VITUS dissociated assay was reduced by 50% compared to the total assay. And when either the total assay or the dissociated assay were followed by a C6 EIA in a modified approach, increases in specificity were observed. Um, and finally, um, they uh, mentioned that all modified combinations of testing were more sensitive than the standard algorithms. Now, whether or not we end up uh, moving to a C6 uh, approach um, I think by looking at those numbers, you can uh, really see some of the benefits of running a dissociated assay uh, compared to uh, a total assay. I mean, not only do they only corroborate the previous studies that I showed you, um, it significantly does reduce the Western blots needed for confirmatory testing, mainly because you only have to run the blot that is positive from the, either the IgM EIA or the IgG EIA. In our case, and what we see uh, in our clinic, uh, is that you get first-line results of the specific Lyme antibodies that are present in infected patients. It allows you a quicker snapshot and window into where that patient is in their disease course. So in other words, if you have a patient who comes in who is IgM positive only, uh, you can pretty much assume uh, 
uh, that they are in the early stages of the disease. They may not have serious symptoms at that point. However, they have not seroconverted at that time. Uh, unfortunately, in order to confirm a lot of this, I'd have to say, you know, serologically, it is very, very difficult to get a patient to come back in for convalescent testing. However, I can say in those patients that I have convinced to return uh, in research purposes, we do find that uh, borne out, that once they were treated, they did seroconvert um, later on. Uh, however, that is where we also see the persistence of those IgM antibodies for much longer than what you might clinically think they would be. So I'd like to say um, in closing, and I'd be you know, willing to take any questions in a, in a few minutes, um, that this dissociated assay actually provides your uh, laboratory with uh, quicker diagnostic results uh, that you can couple with clinical symptoms uh, that may or not be present. Um, giving you a window into the disease course and uh, potentially leading to an earlier diagnosis and uh, treatment of Lyme disease. Uh, we all have heard the horror stories and know uh, the issues for those patients who have in the past uh, been told that uh, their serology was uh, negative and therefore they did not uh, have uh, Lyme disease and then went on to develop uh, full-blown uh, chronic uh, symptoms and uh, how they linger. And that um, population, unfortunately, uh, is growing. Um, and I think anything that uh, we can do to uh, actually uh, increase the uh, earlier diagnosis in this particular uh, disease and treat it uh, quicker uh, would be clinically useful. So I'd like to thank you uh, for listening, and uh, Judy, I'll turn it back over to you for questions. Thank you, Dr. Prisco, for your presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Dr. Prisco will answer as many questions as time permits. The first question is, how much of a cost reduction have you seen in your lab using Vitus dissociated assay? So I would say uh, because the Western blot is so much more expensive uh, than these uh, Vitus dissociated assays, and, and you can narrow uh, down uh, the amount uh, you are running, uh, my last uh, calculation was that we actually saved about 37% in costs in, on this Lyme assay alone uh, just in reagents. Now, that doesn't mean, that, that does not include manpower, et cetera. Uh, the other thing that's important is remember you're also reducing costs to patients as well. How long have you, been, have you been using C6 confirmatory testing in your lab, and have you seen similar results to the CDC study? Um, I have used uh, in the research setting uh, and upon request uh, C6 confirmatory testing, and I've been doing that now for about 18 months, and I do see very similar results uh, as uh, the CDC uh, has shown. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. Um, and uh, like I said, I'd like to, you know, really emphasize that um, you do not see the same uh, type of reaction in patients who are not um, IgG positive. So uh, just keep that in mind. Have you ever used the C6 peptide assay and seen the same results? Yes. How much of a reduction in a Western blot have you seen using the Vitus dissociated assay? We see uh, at least, uh, on our end, at least a 20 to 25 percent reduction in uh, Western blots that are needed. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, it also depends on the uh, patient population we get into the clinic. As I mentioned, because we're an island, we also see a lot of tourists. So. Some, some uh, seasons we get a lot of people early uh, in the disease and you'll see fewer reductions. But on average, it's at least a 25% reduction. 
What happens in the event a patient insists on Lyme testing and the EIA screen is negative and the Western blot is positive for IgM antibodies? <laughs> so, how would so I guess the the question is is how would you have an EIA that's negative and a Western blot? Well, all right. So you're saying you would have a Western blot that has less than one or two bands so that it would come back um, as some type of exposure. I have seen that in the past, uh, and generally what I do is uh, I revert back to symptoms, and uh, if the patient is, you know, telling us that they clearly have symptoms, uh, they would be uh, treated. And, you know, a lot of times those symptoms are very subjective, uh, muscle aches, et cetera, um, and I think in the case of Lyme, it is always much more important to err on the side of caution. Uh, and in our case here, uh, our clinicians uh, would more than likely uh, treat uh, that uh, patient rather than have them to go on uh, and develop chronic symptoms. Can you clarify the significance of the C6 region of the IgG? Yes, so um, what you're looking at in uh, the C6 region, whether or not you want to consider it uh, significant, is it's just another target. So there's an invariant region on the IgG antibody that is present um, that you can also that uh, you can also target, and it oh, it actually confers a little bit more uh, sensitivity in terms of the, uh, detecting the IgG uh, antibody, uh, and it is essentially another way to look at um, the presence of IgG antibodies. What is the reason for the C6 assay only looking for IgG, and is there any evidence that IgM antibodies don't react with C6? Um, actually, there is some cross-reactivity um, that I have seen uh, uh, personally, um, but not having used it uh, in a volume that I would be comfortable saying uh, that uh, there is no reactivity, I would say you could probably expect that. Do these tests also indicate co-infections like anaplasmosis? Uh, actually, no, they do not. Um, because these are Lyme-specific uh, antibodies. There is some crossover. There are some inflammatory mediator uh, antibodies that are produced, but they're produced in a low enough level that these are Lyme-specific antibodies. Um, however, I would uh, caution uh, most uh, clinicians and have many times where even uh, here on the island we see at least a 5 or 6% uh, co-infection rate uh, with other tick-borne diseases. So even if you've ruled out Lyme, it would be, you know, uh, also good to make sure uh, that people are not co-infected with other tick-borne disease. Where would Lyme PCR fit into the algorithm? Um, at this point, uh, PCR is not useful in anything but um, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, the actual spirochete um, DNA is not, doesn't appear to be present in, high enough in plasma uh, to be used in a plasma level, so it's really only used in the CSF at this time. Uh, speaking uh, personally, again, I have tried uh, using um, a very nutrient uh, media to immediately inoculate cultures to try to grow the spirochete. And uh, I have to say the actual success rate of uh, growing it is uh, is pretty abysmal. It's pretty tough to do. If the C6 invariant is present only on IgG, why is the immunoblot IgM run on the C6 assay? That's a good question. Um, I um, actually, um, the only thing, and um, I, I think, you know, we may have to uh, ask the our, our CDC colleagues, but I, I think the idea was to put the uh, specimens through the same type of paradigm that they would have seen uh, normally. Um, so you're going to run it, run it through both. Uh, 
So the specificity really uh, leans much more uh, heavier on the IgG side than it does on the IgM side. Please elaborate on the identity of the multiple bands on Western blot. Um, I'm assuming by ent uh, identity you're talking about the markers. So on the Western blot, there are several different types of antigens. So when you look at uh, the uh, bands, there are a collection of a known nine or ten, I believe, that are known to be uh, present uh, in Lyme disease. And um, that's uh, what you're seeing as markers on the side there. So the uh, 17 kilodalton, those are actually protein markers uh, for antibodies. Um, and what you see is um, the presence or absence of those particular bands on the Western blot. Some of these you see uh, in uh, IgM as well, um, but and some of them appear at different stages of the disease. Um, I've sometimes seen that as true and sometimes as not. Uh, however, what you see on the right side of that particular slide are the an uh, antigens that are proteins that are normally uh, screened for in an IgG Western blot. If the erythema migrans rash is only 71% at best, why does the CDC consider that a requirement for a confirmed positive? And the person says, I know you can't speak for the CDC, but can you give an opinion <laughs> on this? Right, all right, so uh, let me just say that that um, originally uh, was the uh, symptom that was used as uh, a diagnostic uh, marker for Lyme, uh, and uh, I think it's, you know, we're, we're now seeing it more and more and, and enough prevalence and incidence and realizing that um, that may be a bit artificial uh, but because that has been used as a diagnostic criteria, um, that actually still exists. Um, however, most uh, clinicians will look for the rash, but if they don't see it, uh, that does not mean similar to that. If they don't always get a positive serology, will they say that this person has uh, does not have Lyme disease? So I think you know people are getting uh, better at saying, okay. They don't have a rash, but I'm going to test them anyway. Do the antibodies persist after treatment? Actually, they do. Um, they can persist uh, sometimes years after treatment. I have uh, patients who come in uh, to the clinic uh, on the research side uh, who I was working with who have had uh, infections up to six, seven years ago and still have uh, both IgM and IgG antibodies. Uh, perhaps not to the level that would be considered positive on the Western uh, blot, in other words, uh, two and five, uh, but they do definitely persist, which is why it's really important to get a very detailed clinical history from these patients. How often do you see persistence of IgM for prolonged periods of time, say many years? Um, as I just said, I would say that I've seen the persistence in probably, I'm trying to think of our data bank, probably in about, I, I want to say, and I'm just, you know, thinking off the top of my head here, don't quote me on this, probably in about 20% of the patients that we have in our data bank uh, have um, persistent IgM antibodies for longer than a year. What is the prevalence of Lyme disease in the tick population? That's an excellent question. Uh, we recently just uh, did a survey of both the uh, deer uh, and uh, tick population to see basically how many deer we had in a particular square area because they were easily to, easier to detect than the white-footed mouse. Uh, and then uh, an estimate of certain areas of uh, where we know uh, the ticks are quite um, prevalent. And uh, here on the island, we see at least 50% of the ticks here on the island uh, carry uh, Lyme disease. Uh, and another 30% of those will carry more than one tick-borne disease. So um, I think it's safe to assume 
that uh, if you have a tick on you I, here on the island, I would assume it's carrying Lyme, uh, and uh, to seek assistance immediately. With the vitus-dissociated assay, are both results reported to the physician, and if so, is that problematic for their interpretation? Actually, it's not, and I do report both, and they are both reported. Um, we have done a lot of education around this assay uh, here to uh, physicians to train them to look at both uh, what they were getting before and what they're getting now. So they really do uh, have a better understanding uh, of what they're seeing. So uh, it hasn't been a problem for us, uh, mainly because we, you know, we did a lot of education around it so that they uh, understand what they're looking at. Uh, and then they also realize uh, that they may only get one and maybe not two uh, blot results uh, back, um, but they are quite comfortable with the dual result and uh, really like the ability to uh, know uh, which of the two antibodies they have present or both. What is the value of the Lyme PCR and how does it compare with the EIA? Well, the Lyme PCR has very limited use. As um, I was uh, talking about, it's really only used in cerebral spinal fluid and some joint fluids is really uh, the and. So it has a very, very limited use. Um, the EIA obviously is, you know, is much more uh, well used and uh, off the available um, first tier screen. Um, so unless you're, you know, got someone who's, you know, has a, a hugely engorged um, joint or is complaining of a headache and nothing else, um, the uh, Lyme PCR really uh, doesn't have much use uh, compared to other tick-borne disease PCRs where you're actually, whether that be anaplasmosis or babesiosis for say, or um, in terms of those PCRs, which are quite predictive. Do you test CSF for Lyme, and if yes, what method do you use? Um, we don't do it here uh, on the island. We do send that off to the uh, Mayo Clinic, and I believe they use their own uh, PCR-developed uh, method, so I really I can't speak to that. You said you had a 30% savings of cost of reagents, even with buying mm -hmm. twice as many screening kits? Uh, no. Um, so cost of reagents um, in terms of, if you're thinking of it uh, in terms of because you have to run one of each, the actual uh, screening kit cost is, is not double. And when I said I had 30% of savings, I was talking about also that you uh, did not have to run uh, as many Western blocks. So that was included uh, in our savings estimate. To clarify, we use the dissociated Vitus IgG and IgM and have been sending positives to our reference lab for full Western blot as opposed to just IgG Western blot or IgM Western blot. Oh, hang on one second, more of a question. So mm -hmm. if just EIA IgG is positive, we could send only for IgG Western blot? Correct. Great. Yeah. Is there any Even evidence? Go ahead. No, no, please, please continue. I, I was just going to say by, you know, standard and guidance, you only run blots on those EIAs that are positive. So if you don't have a, a Western blot that, or an EIA and IgM, say, that's positive, you don't need to run the blot. Is there any evidence of the penetration of non-U.S. strains? Um, actually, that's a good question. And I think where we're actually seeing that uh, is in some other, what they're calling other tick-borne diseases through the uh, Lone Star tick that is now uh, carrying a Lyme-like disease. It is very similar. Uh, however, its trajectory uh, in terms of infection is quicker and a little more virulent. Um, and it, it doesn't appear... Um, as if, and, and what we see in that particular disease 
is an, an IgG and C6 reactivity and, and less of an IgM reactivity. So there's some question of whether or not that's actually even a Lyme variant or not. Uh, but that's uh, all that I'm aware of. Uh, in terms of spread throughout other regions and areas of the U.S. from, you know, over the past 20 years, uh, is a lot of things that so people are traveling more, number one, their pets are traveling more, et cetera, uh, and there is more of a um, tendency for people to be, you know, outside hiking, et cetera, and uh, they may not be um, aware of uh, ticks and uh, tick-borne disease. Do you believe the warmer weather will cause a large number of cases to spread to other states with presently low numbers and see an overall rise in all states this year that would be significant enough for the media outlets to report it to the public? Uh, that's a good question, too. I know we see a rise here. Um, we're already seeing more cases now in May um, than we did uh, last year, mainly because we had a pretty mild winter. Now, whether or not that translates to other places that ha had a mild winter, uh, I can't say, but I imagine if we're seeing it, they probably are too. Okay. Looks like we may have time for one more question. Um, this person says um, they had technical difficulties, so they joined us a little bit late, but they're asking, which island are you referring to? Uh, Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And, the coast of uh, Massachusetts. <laughs> okay, we, we can wait for more questions to come in, but during that time, uh, I would like to once again thank Dr. Prisco for her presentation. Do you have any final comments? Um, I would just actually like to thank uh, everyone for attending, and um, if you have any questions or whatever, if I can be of any uh, help, um, Bia Maru uh, has my contact information, et cetera. You can feel free to reach out to them, and I'd be more than happy to help you. I'd also like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We would also like to thank our sponsor, Bia Maru, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through November 8, 2017. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay, and we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>